we had it was probably triggered by the Australian players not only looking at themselves but also looking at the state cricketers and comparing our lot to other professional sports here in Australia and also overseas. Whereas AFL had a collective bargaining agreement and the rugby, rugby union and league players also had decent agreements, contracts for all players, whether, um, whether they were playing Australian sport or the club level or whatever. Whereas cricket, we had our international um, cricketers being paid little or nothing having these terrible contracts which were very much master-slave contracts. And then we had the next level of players, I mean the state players, where I think there was only one or two states that had contracts at all. And it was very much a matter of, um, you train with us all the time, we'll use your image, we'll do what we like with it, um, and we'll just pay you when you, play, when you play a game. And if you get injured, well, so be it. So I think we just looked at that general lot and thought, well, you know, we've really got to do something here. The game's getting more professional and we need to be treated more professionally. Alan Border was very strong on the um, association and had been trying to organise one for quite some time. Steve Waugh was very um, proactive. Mark Taylor was uh, proactive um, for the majority of the case. There's a little story about where he, things got a little bit clouded a little bit later on. But it was major more so the senior members of the Australian team that really sort of took it upon themselves to push for some sort of progress in getting better conditions, not just for the Australian sides, but more importantly for the state teams, which was very, very important to the international players. At, at the end of the day, the strength of any organisation or association, particularly a player association, comes from the players themselves. If you don't have um, the strength of the, of the association, and the strength of the prospective members, which were the players, well, you're going to fail. Um, and simply some people had to be shown, you know, it's just, it's, it's just like a cricket team. When you go in, you're new to a cricket team, you look to your leaders for guidance. And these guys on the Australian side, the more senior fellas, just stood up and, and led. And without that leadership, you know, the ACA never would have got off the ground. And we brought James Erskine and his mob called SEL, Sports and Entertainment Limited, on board. And it was basically through a threat, a friend of a friend who had some dealings in the sporting industry with James. And um, he, he got discussing the ACA plight because it had been reported that the ACA was a fledgling orga organisation. They were attempting to negotiate with the uh, Australian Cricket Board. The Australian Cricket Board would have been very elusive. Um, in terms of meeting with us and non-cooperative in terms of negotiations. So, to cut a long story short, Erskine actually rang me and we talked about things and I was very aware that, that there have been numerous attempts for an ACA equivalent to be established by previous players and sets of players and it had fallen down for two much reasons. One, they always used a current player in the negotiations and that, that current player always felt compromised and in a position where he just, he was worried if he pushed the envelope too far that would be the end of his international career or whatever. And secondly it was just finances. We didn't have any finances, you know, you can't just rely on membership subscriptions to survive and if you're going into a battle you need a war chest. Now Erskine, one of the things that Erskine and I talked about was could he provide that war chest? And he agreed to fund the association which was, I think, probably the most important aspect of the ACA being formed and being able to withstand Cricket Australia, or ACB as it was in those days, and their just their general sort of non-cooperativeness. Um, now we get to the meeting in Canterbury. The, the, that meeting, the purpose was to introduce James to the fellas, um, for James to get uh, indication and a feel of how much did these guys want change and how far they would go to achieve that change. On the other side of the coin, the players wanted to meet James to see whether he was the man to, that would fit into our plans that could do it for us. And so it was just sort of a, a meeting about deciding uh, are we suited to each other? And following that meeting, we all agreed that we're suited for each other and it just it went from there. So was there, was there any backlash or did you see any risks in getting him involved? Yeah, there's always risks. It was just another excuse for, um, the, at the end of the day, for the Australian Cricket Board 
not to deal with this. Uh, they like to keep the game, you know, within people within the game. Does that make sense? I probably could have said that better, but they um, that was a risk, and they certainly played that card that there was this external party or whatever, and you know, beware the imposter and all that sort of stuff. There were lines that they threw out, but it was important for us in terms of our association to have expertise. Um, the players needed to have somebody who is experienced in negotiating to negotiate for them. Cricket Australia are able to employ whoever they like, lawyers and um, people to represent them, so why couldn't the players do exactly the same? Um, so that was, that was important, Paul. I, I probably got involved because I was about the only person in the Australian team at the time that was A, probably on the way out of the Australian team, and B, had some sort of commerce or legal background. I'd done an economics degree, done some law subjects and sort of, and had worked in private enterprise for quite a while. So uh, the rest of the guys sort of didn't really have that background. And they just, Mark Taylor at the end of the day, it was about 1996, just came up and just said, look, you know, we've talked amongst ourselves and we'd like you, if you wanted, to sort of head up the establishment of this ACA. Um, and I told him, I just said, well, you know, I think one of the reasons it has, they've failed in the past is you have a current player representing it. And you said, well, you know, I'm not sure, quite sure how long you're going to be a current player. And so I saw the writing on the wall at that stage, when you don't have the vote of the captain, you're in a bit of trouble. So I, I shortly afterwards retired from cricket and then took this thing up on, on a full-time basis, which you've got to if you want to make it successful. And do you mind me asking what, what they paid you at that time? I don't know if they paid me. I so, don't think they did. So uh, the, in, initially, you like, huh? When, what was your motivation for doing it? Oh, because I've been surrounded by it, and the players were just getting a, a terrible deal. And now your mates, like, you, not only you want to do the right thing by your mates, but you actually want to create some sort of pathway for cricketers coming up, not just then, but you know, in the future. And it was just important to do it. And, it, and really, it was a no-brainer in terms of is this the right thing to do? Of course, it was. Um, it was so important for cricketers to get proper representation and sort of move themselves from basically an 18th century sort of treatment from their board to something a little bit more professional. Graham had just been um, sacked for, as chief executive of the Australian Cricket Board who had a falling out with the uh, chairman, a guy called um, Rogers, um, from, um, uh, from Tasmania. And one of the things that we'd never get from Cricket Australia or ACB was we weren't able to pinpoint exactly what their finances were. Um, we, there was a lot of mistrust about figures that they would put in front of us. One of the major benefits of bringing Graham Halbish on board was whilst Graham, by virtue of various contracts or whatever, was unable to share that information with us from his previous employer, the Australian Cricket Board could then not say, here is these financials, they had to basically put the real stuff in front of us because Graham would know that they wouldn't be the real stuff. So we actually, it, it, the major reason was to gain surety about their financial situation. And once you've gained that, then we were in a position to be able to put some sort of responsible sort of negotiation um, in place. He, yeah, he was important at that stage, but um, you know, he wasn't with the ACA that long. He was only with the ACA for a couple of months. It cre created a bit of animosity, which you, you would expect between Cricket Australia, or ACB and the ACA. Um, and then um, we moved Graham sideways, and where he uh, then joined sports and entertainment.